In this video, we'll be talking about white box option setup. I had the privilege of being there when Javad and uh, his engineers came up with this idea. Basically, the user has great latitude in determining what uh, he wants the appearance of the receiver to, to be, uh, what controls he wants to have at any particular time. And I found myself often, uh, depending on the job, depending on the needs of the project, changing what white box options that I have. And this will make a little more sense to you as you watch this video. But you've got incredible flexibility in the way that you can control uh, what's available to you at any particular moment on the screen of the Triumph LS and Victor LS. And uh, we'll take a look at that now. Um, these white box options are available in the action screens, the collect action and the stake action. A little bit different options available to each screen uh, simply because you're performing different types of operations in collect and within stake. And uh, some of the options carry over between the two uh, operations, collect and stake. So we'll see some similar white box options and we'll see some variations on those, but we'll be taking a look at that in this video, showing you how to change those options and some of the neat things that you can do with the visibility of those white boxes. So uh, for right now, we're gonna go in to uh, collect, which takes us to the prepare screen. We'll click next, which then takes us to the collect action screen. You'll notice that there are 10 clear boxes on either side of the map. The green circle you'll recall from other videos is our current position on the map and it indicates because it's green that we have a fixed position. Now then in order to uh, change these options when, it, when they're clear we just press that clear box. And I'm going to go through and show you some of the options that I prefer, but we have quite a few different options available to us um, that you can use. So it, it depends on what you as a user find to be important. First, I like to use point name for my upper left corner. Now then when we press this button, once it's established, it takes us to a screen where we can change the point name. So I'm going to change the name here to point one, two, three, four and press OK. And now you see the point name has changed to 1, 2, 3, 4. Now then if I want to change this box to something else, I touch that button on the screen and hold it. Instead of just a quick press, I press and hold and it takes me back to the white box selection screen. So I can change it to something else at this point if I wanted to. Let's change it to point description. So now point description fills this uh, particular white box. If I touch it, then I'm taken to the point description uh, editor. So I can type in a uh, tree, for instance, for my description. Pressing OK, and now we see tree fills that white box. If I want to change it to something else, I press and hold this time on the screen, and now I've changed it back to point name, which is what I prefer there. If I want to completely remove it and have it clear, then I can uh, select none and now it goes back to uh, the state that it was in originally. But let's go ahead and put it back to point name and move on. For the next one, I like to use page. Page uh, represents sub projects and I like to make sure that I'm storing my points in the proper sub project on in my big project. So for me, I like to see that page so that I know that I'm putting the points where I expect them to be in the database. Okay, let's look over on the right side. Uh, I use tags quite a bit because I build lines in JField and tags are the uh, name of those lines. Next, I use code and we'll talk more about codes in, in other videos. Uh, below that, I like to use attribute so that I'm able to fill in those values and see what those values are as I fill them in. Below that, I use point description. And I use point description really more as a descriptive text if there's more information that I want to place 
with a point than what my attributes allow. Most of the time my attributes cover everything I need to know, but if there's some little specific odd detail, then I'll use description, which is uh, different from a lot of other software. And you'll recall we used tree previously for the description, so it shows up as tree still. And then on the bottom right, I like to use photo record. Now you'll notice that the photo record icon has a red X. That photo record icon is useful uh, because we can take a picture and attach it to a point when we collect it uh, right before we accept the measurement and makes a real convenient, handy way to attach as many photos as you want to a point as you store it. And then those photos are, are uniquely tied to that point for your uh, records. So let's take a measurement and let's see how uh, photo record works in a, in a real world setting. So right now we're taking our measurement, collecting our data. Once the data has been collected and we're ready to accept the shot, before pressing the green accept button, I'm gonna press the uh, photo record button. And you notice that the red X has changed to a green check mark, indicating that it's now available for use. So it turns on the front facing camera and we wanna take a picture of that tree. And so now I'll use the uh, shutter on the upper right to take the picture, pressing the shutter, then we'll take the picture. We get a notation that says the photo is attached successfully. We press OK. And we can resume taking more pictures if we like. I'm just going to attach that one. We we'll press OK. And then press accept. And it's going to store the point. All right. Now then let's go to points. And we'll see how this point has that photo attached to it. I'm going to edit this point, which on the left side, we see that there's there are two images attached. And now we see our image that's been attached to that point. And then next to that, we see that the second image is the screen capture, as I had configured in uh, our action setup, which we'll talk about in another video. So that's the photo record option. Again, it's a great fast way to attach photos to a point. And those photos in the digital file of the photo itself, the coordinates for this point are stored. So uh, if you have a software like Google Earth that can work with those geotags in the photos, then the software has you covered. All right, so looking at more white box options, we see on the left side, we're gonna add distance to last. Distance to last is a handy little option shows you epic by epic what the distance was from the last point that you tied. Uh, the top number is a horizontal distance and the bottom number is the vertical difference. It's a handy way if you're doing topographic work to be able to keep up with where you are from your last observation. Here I've selected the verify statistics so I can watch and see if any of the epics during recording exceed my tolerance of acceptability, uh, the values would increase there in that box as I was collecting, if that were the case. So with the level vial camera, it turns the bottom camera on, looking down at the level vial, and the engineer that developed this particular white box, a brilliant fellow that um, was able to isolate just the view of the level vial and depict it in the screen. And by pressing the image, it causes the software to uh, evaluate where that level vial is and zoom in on just that portion. So there you can see the bubble inside the circle. It allows you a heads up view of your level if you don't wanna use the tilt compensation and you don't have to look down at your bubble. You can keep your eyes on the screen. Next one I wanna show you is the base rover statistics button. It's a great, Great little feature that shows you the 
coordinates of your base, shows you the current coordinates of the rover, and these are as broadcast. So if you're not receiving a correction, you won't see the base coordinates filled in, but if you are receiving a correction, then the coordinates are uh, displayed here, but they show you what the actual uh, incoming correction base coordinates are, not what you programmed it to be, but what you're actually receiving. So it's a, a good check there. The R to B shows the rover to base direction, horizontal distance, and vertical difference. It's a good button to pay attention to before you take off from your base. Um, you know, if you want to check and make sure your vertical's about right, if you're on flat ground, that value should be close to zero when you have the rover, you know, within a foot or two of the base point. So it's a good, good um, rough check to make sure that everything's looking right, a good reality check. Um, and then pressing back takes us back to the collect action screen. So these are my favorite options, white box options for collect. And you may have others that you prefer depending on what your uh, your task is, what you're surveying. And uh, they have quite a few options and they're adding new white boxes all the time based on user comments and needs. So with that said, let's uh, back out of here and now let's take a look at the stakeout white box options. All right, so from the home screen, we'll press stake, which takes us to the stake prepare screen, and go to stake next. I've already got set up to stake out a point named C1, which shows at the top of the map screen. As I mentioned earlier, the options for the stake white box options are um, a bit different from the collect white box options. Some of the same, Options are available, but a lot of these are different. With the internal compass in the Triumph LS, a user can actually work using um, a head and back, left and right, relative to the orientation of the LS at any particular moment. Normally with staking out a point with RTK, you've got to know what, uh, what direction north is so that you can make your adjustments in north, south, east, west. But with the internal compass here, you can just work directly off of uh, the orientation of the receiver. And it's nice rectangular sides, make it easy to tell what direction the receiver is facing and what direction is left and right. So it works a lot like directions from a total station, just ahead and back and left and right. So we've got white box options that allow for this. And when we're staking out an alignment, rather than being Related to the compass direction, the ahead, back, left, and right is related to the center line alignment. So the ahead, back, left, and right have dual purpose depending on what it is we're staking and how we're staking. In this case, uh, since we're staking out a point, it's going to be related to the compass. For some users, they may want to have that north, south, and east, west direction. So we've got that white box option available uh, and then we also probably want to know our cut and fill if we're staking out something with a particular elevation, target elevation. So then on the right side, what I like to do is use um, course to target, which is abbreviated CTT. So there we see it's uh, 315 degrees is the calculated direction from where we're standing. Then I like to use the course to target arrow, which just gives a graphic display on the screen of what direction we need to turn the instrument uh, to be pointing in the direction of the uh, target point. And then distance to target is the radial distance from where we are to our target point. Just to be certain that I'm staking out the proper point, I like to display the point description of the point being staked, which in this case is calculated corner, and you see that the text is just a little too big for that particular box, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then for that final box, I'll like to use the accept as box. When pressed, after we've taken our shot, we can dictate what to call this point and it will be stored just like uh, any other surveyed point that might be uh, we collected in the collect action screen. So these are my favorite choices for the white box options. And now let's take a look at what it's like to actually use those to navigate to a point. We see right now in the top of the screen that the LS is currently pointed at an azimuth of 43 degrees and that the course to target is about 315 degrees. Now as I turn the LS, we see the arrow for the 
course to target arrow, turn up, which means the LS is pointed in the direction of the point. And now I'm going to start walking and we see the distance to target close in. Now then I'm standing in a where uh, the point is almost directly to my left. So I move to the left. And then I can back up a foot. Okay, and then I move over to the right a little bit. And without even knowing, right now it's cloudy outside, so without even knowing what direction north is, I'm using the ahead, uh, back, and right, left white boxes to get me on point. Now then, some of this text in the white boxes is rounded. Depending on the amount of the value, it can be rounded to the nearest unit. But when we press the action button, it expands these white boxes so that we can see more detail in these white boxes and see more precision in the, in the numbers. I really like to use the LS as a tape measure. So if I collect a point, I can then stake to that point and start walking. And if I want to be uh, 5,000 feet from that point, I can use that distance to target, press that action button, and it shows me the full precision of what I'm looking at in terms of a distance. So now then, let's go ahead and take a shot. I press the start button, and what happens, the measurement is averaged, the position is averaged, and you'll notice that although the coordinates are moving at the bottom, epic to epic, that the white box values are not changing. The white box values that we see right now are related to the average position and will stay that way until we reject the measurement or accept it. Now I'm going to use accept as and notice that the description says that it's staked C1. So we could leave that in there or I could type something else, say set half inch iron rod But really, for my purposes, I like to use codes and attributes. I've got one set up for boundary, and you can see these attributes are set up for found, set, size of the monument, the type, whether there's an ID cap on it, what the condition is. And these are, these are settings that I've set up for my code. And rather than typing all these things out, I can go in and select them from an attribute list very, very quickly, very efficiently uh, with a minimum number of keystrokes. And so in this case, I'm going to change this to set half inch iron rod. So that pretty well sums up what you can do with white boxes. Again, there are several other white boxes that we haven't looked at, but there is a great deal of power and utility in the white box options to change the setups and make it work the way that you want it to work for your particular application.